Hello class. We are now going to be discussing our synovial joints, the joints that are diarthrotic joints. What does diarthrotic mean? It means they are freely movable. And it are, is our synovial joints that are freely mo uh, movable. So I just brought this picture in, alexgray.com. He's a, a great anatomy artist and I am going to actually be showing you a video from an anatomy or well, an, an artist uh, website that is focusing on anatomy. It's one of the best videos I've seen on the synovial joints so I'll be showing you some of um, that artist website also. So these are the six types of synovial joints. And remember, it is the shape of the articulating bone surfaces, i.e. the anatomy, how it's built, that will determine um, the movements that are allowed, i.e. its function. So when we st we're going to start with plane or gliding joints. These are only going to be allowing non-axial movement. It's not really moving in any axis. It's going to be just allowing gliding type movement. That's the first one. Then we're going to go to our hinge joints. That's the second synovial joint. Now hinge joints allow movement in one axis, monoaxial movement. A hinge joint will only allow flexion and extension. Our, our third a synovial joint is a pivot joint and it is also monoaxial. It is only allowing rotational movement. And we're going to be looking at all these individually. Our, our fourth synovial joint is a condyloid joint aka ellipsoidal joint and it is going to be allowing movement in two planes, two axes. It will allow flexion and extension and ab and adduction. So that's going to be our condyloid joints. And the saddle joint that you need to know, the thumb joint, is a modified condyloid joint. It will allow flexion, extension, ab and adduction. But remember, our thumb joint also will allow opposition. And our last type of synovial joint is our ball and socket joint. These are going to have uh, movements in all three dimensions, flexion, extension, ab and adduction, circumduction, and rotation. So we're going to start with our plane, our AKA gliding joints. So in a plane or gliding joint, we are just getting this movement. It's once one surface of one bone is gliding or sliding across the surface of another bone. The three gliding joints that you need to know is going to be number one, the acromioclavicular joint, AC joint. This is the acromial end of the clavicle and the acromial process of the scapula, your AC joint, a gliding joint. Then we have our intercarpal and intertarsal joints. We're talking about the joints in between the carpals and the joints in between the tarsal bones of the foot. Those are just going to be allowing a gliding motion. And the third one will be the sacroiliac joint, the auricular surface of the sacrum and the auricular surface of the ilium. That is going to be your sacroiliac joint, SI joint. It is allowing a gliding motion. 
So let's, I'm going to show you the little video now of how he describes a plane or gliding joint. The plane joint. Not really as interesting as the others, but deserves our love anyway. It's basically two flat-ish surfaces, one on top of the other. These surfaces can glide or rotate. They usually come in groups, like the carpals of the hand and the tarsals of the foot. Ligaments hold these bones together, but might allow some rotation and gliding. Another plane joint is the acromioclavicular joint. That's the one between the clavicle and acromion process of the scapula. When we elevate the shoulder, the angle in here will adjust to keep the scapula vertical. Our second type of synovial joint is going to be the hinge joint. It is monoaxial, only allows movement in one plane. A hinge joint is like the hinge on the door. It just opens and closes. So when you think of a hinge, you're going to be thinking of the elbow, which is your classic hinge joint. It just flex and extends. Your knee, it's going to flex and extend. These are the big hinge joints. And your distal interphalange joints, these only allow flexion and extension. And the middle interphalange joints. These also only allow flexion and extension. So let's see how he describes our hinge joints. The hinge joint. The hinge is a very simple joint. It allows movement only on one axis. Its structure prevents rotation this way or this way. The head of the bone wraps around the cylindrical head of the other allowing a very stable rotation this way. Going back to the terminology from last week, the hinge joint allows flexion and extension. That's it. That's all it does. But it does it well. Like the hinges on a door allow it only to open or close. The best example of it is the elbow. Here's the rotation on a simplified skeleton. Flexion and extension. Our third synovial joint is the pivot joint. Now this is also a monoaxial joint. It only allows movement in one plane and in this case it is just um, rotation around a central axis. Now we've seen these before when I talked about rotational movement. You saw the Elanto axial joint, C1 and C2, we get the rotation around the dens. So C1 is rotating around the dens of C2 to give you this rotational movement. And we saw the head of the radius rotating around the ulna at the radial notch to give you a rotational movement. So let's see how our artist describes these joints. So if the elbow only allows flexion and extension, how is it that we're able to twist the forearm? Well, let's take a look at the next joint, the pivot joint. The pivot joint also allows rotation at only one axis. However, it rotates along the long axis. A cylindrical bone fits into a ring of bone and ligament, like the radial ulnar joint just below the elbow. The cap on the radius bone fits nicely into this notch on the ulna bone. Ligaments complete the ring, holding the bone in place and allow the radius only to rotate inside of it. The result on the forearm is what we call pronation and supination. During pronation, the base of the radius rotates over and around the head of the ulna. The ulna stays relatively still. Remember, the hinge joint at the elbow prevents the ulna from twisting. So all of that twisting happens at the radius. And by the way, 
the distal joint of the ulna and radius is also a pivot joint. The combination of the pivot at the top and at the bottom creates that twisting motion for pronation and supination. Wasn't that a good, a great explanation of a pivot joint? Not from an anatomy site, but from um, an artist drawing site. Great video. Our next synovial joint is going to be called the condyloid, aka ellipsoid joint. What you need to know about this is it is biaxial. It moves in two planes. This is going to allow flexion and extension and ab and adduction. Remember, flexion and extension was in the sagittal plane. Ab and adduction were in the coronal plane. So the ones you need to know, and it's not too many, it's two, is going to be the radiocarpal joint, aka your wrist joint, the distal radius with the scaphoid and lunate, that is your wrist joint. Remember the wrist will give you flexion and extension and ab and adduction. Then you go to the metacarpal, metacarpal phalange joints, the MCP joints. These are going to be able to give you flexion and extension. And when you spread out your fingers and bring them back together, ab and adduction. So let's see the video on the condyloid. He'll be using the, the term ellipsoid. Um, but that is our condyloid joint. The ellipsoid joint. The ellipsoid joint is very similar to a ball and socket. However, the ligaments and its oval shape prevent rotation. But it still has the ability to rotate on two axes, which allows flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, a great example of an ellipsoid joint is the wrist, also known as the radial carpal joint. The group of carpal bones rotate inside the socket of the radius. Our fifth joint is the saddle joint. Now the saddle joint is what we call a modified condylar joint. It has biaxial movement moves in two planes, so it's going to allow flexion, extension, ab and adduction, plus a little bit more. And in the saddle joint that we've talked about before is going to allow opposition of the thumb. Now this is where the trapezium and the metacarpal of the thumb come into play. So always remember the thumb swings from the trapezium and that allows for opposition. So let's look at his video. The saddle joint. The saddle joint is similar to the ellipsoid, but the rotation is limited mostly because of the bone structure. The structure of the saddle is very interesting. Both bones have a concave and convex surface. Convex means the surface sticks out like a hill. Concave means the surface curves in, like a hole, or a cave. The concave plane of one fits on the convex plane of the other. It's like a 3D yin-yang, or a cowboy on a horse. The saddle makes the bottom piece, and the cowboy's legs make the top piece. The legs of the top piece, which wrap around the body of the bottom piece, allow a rotation this way. The body of the top piece can glide inside the legs of the bottom piece. So this unique structure allows the joint to flex, extend, abduct, adduct, circumduct, and very slightly rotate. An example of the saddle joint on the body is the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. Let's see that baby in action. 
And our last type of synovial joint is going to be our ball and socket joint. Ball and socket, it's a triaxial joint, meaning it go, moves in all planes, all three planes, and we only have two ball and socket joints in our body. The head of the humerus in that shallow glenoid fossa, and the head of the femur in that deep acetabulum. So you're going to, uh, this ball and socket joint allows flexion and extension, ab and adduction, circumduction, internal rotation, and external rotation. So let's see his little video on this. The ball and socket joint. The ball and socket is the champion of all joints. Hooray for the ball and socket. Its structure is just like how it sounds. A ball inside of a socket. This simple and effective structure allows it to move in all axes. Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, rotation, and circumduction. The two ball and socket joints of the body are at the hip and the shoulder. The hip has a deep socket, which gives it stability, but limits some range of motion. The shoulder joint has a shallower socket, which gives it greater range of motion, but takes away some stability. Maybe that's why a dislocated shoulder is so common. Ouch. So that's it for the six types of synovial joints. Make sure you know what they are and where you can find them. The ones I have listed for you are the ones you need to know for any exam. Our quiz, I can just say, show you a picture of um, the elbow and I would say, what kind of joint is it? What kind of synovial joint is it? And you would say it's a hinge joint. What kind of action does it allow? Flexion and extension. So make sure you know these and you can find them on the, the body. So that's it. And now it's on to the muscles.